Hello, all you freedom-loving people. Welcome to another episode of Front Page. I'm your host, Scott Cameron Goulet. President Trump attended his first arraignment in New York on Tuesday. The Manhattan District Attorney charged President Trump with 34 felony counts of falsifying business records. The charges sound scary, but none of them actually hold water. Not surprisingly, President Trump pleaded not guilty to all of the charges. Immediately after returning to Mar-a-Lago, Trump gave a speech. The world was listening to him accuse the far left of political persecution by underhanded means because they cannot beat him in the election. Marco Rubio believes that this will doom Democratic politicians to the same fate in the future. Trump's allies have actually expanded in this instance. Mississippi's female senator is the latest to come out in support of President Trump. J.P. Morgan Chase's chief executive warned that the banking crisis is not over. He said that its impact will be felt for years to come. After a 50-year hiatus, NASA will once again open the human moon landing program, and this time they will go even further. Okay, let's get into it. President Trump appeared in a Manhattan courtroom on Tuesday for his first arraignment in the alleged hush money case. He faces 34 counts of falsifying business records. He pleaded not guilty to all of the charges. As he left Trump Tower for the courtroom, President Trump waved to the crowd and he clenched his raised fist. On his way to the courthouse, President Trump posted a message on True Social. He said, heading to Lower Manhattan, the courthouse. Seems so surreal. Wow, they are going to arrest me. Can't believe this is happening in America. Make America great again. Trump's Secret Service motorcade arrived at the courthouse around 12.20 p.m. After getting out of a black SUV, President Trump waved to a group of cameras that were set up across the barricade, and then he walked briskly down the street into a side entrance of the New York Superior Court building. At 2.30 p.m., President Trump entered New York County Supreme Court to be arraigned by Judge Juan Merchan. With a stern expression, President Trump entered the courtroom shortly after his attorney entered. Throughout his arraignment on Tuesday afternoon, President Trump appeared to be very attentive. When the prosecutor began to speak, he sat, hands clasped in front of him, elbows on the table, and listened. The arraignment lasted for about an hour. Trump's lawyer, Todd Blanchet, spoke outside the courtroom saying President Trump was frustrated and upset. He accused prosecutors of turning a purely political issue into a political indictment. The charges against President Trump are all Class E felonies, which are the lowest category of felony in New York State. Joe Tocopina said that, a state prosecutor is prosecuting a federal election law violation that doesn't exist according to federal election law officials. President Trump posted his first statement after the arraignment on True Social at around 5.30 p.m., just lifted off for Palm Beach, Florida. He added, the hearing was shocking to many in that they had no surprises and therefore no case. Virtually every legal pundit has said that there's no case here. There was nothing done illegally. For Trump supporters and independent voters, the parallels between the treatment of the protesters of the January 6th incident at the Capitol and the protesters at Tuesday's indictment of President Trump confirm that President Trump's previous warnings that this administration has turned against the people the very people it is supposed to serve. So within three days of the news that President Trump would be indicted, the Trump campaign received $7 million in donations. Many of the donations were first time donors to President Trump and many were former supporters, but they did all they could to donate to President Trump's team. I'd like to share a comment by one of our supporters in order to support President Trump. He is choosing to cancel his subscription to our membership site in favor of donating the money to the Trump campaign. Rich wrote, Scott, I am deeply sorry I had to cancel my membership of $10 per month at this stage where America is with me being on social security with health issues, I must use all my available funds to support President Trump. I continue to give to him as much as I can. You've been great, Scott. I guess I have become very emotional about America and President Trump. I need to give him as much as I can afford. Thank you for your tremendous, honest reporting over the years. 
if this subscriber is watching this episode, I want to say to you, we're very sorry to see you go, but we support your decision. Much love for you, Richard. President Trump delivered remarks from Mar-a-Lago in Florida following his arraignment in New York City. In addition to Trump's family, there were about 500 supporters who were invited to attend. This included some congressional Republicans who are close to Donald Trump. The president said, I never thought this could happen in America. And I never thought anything like this could happen in America. Never thought it could happen. The only crime that I have committed is to fearlessly defend our nation from those who seek to destroy it. He also talked about the financial scrutiny of his family by the far left who were trying to find dirt on their finances, but of course they failed. But our heads are held very, very high. They want to settle the case, but I want no part of that. President Trump stressed that America is in decline and we cannot allow that to happen. And now these radical left lunatics want to interfere with our elections by using law enforcement. We can't let that happen. With all of this being said, and with a very dark cloud over our beloved country, I have no doubt, nevertheless, that we will make America great again. Thank you very much. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Republican Senator Marco Rubio of Florida released a video lamenting that this event would mark a new normal in American politics. Put aside for a moment whether you like Trump or not like him, whether you're for him or not for him. Today is a bad day for all of us. Today, American politics crosses a line that it's never gonna come back from. After today, after today, especially on the basis of how ridiculous these charges are, after today, every prosecutor in America that wants to make a name for themselves now is gonna have permission to basically go after someone in the other party. What's gonna stop some Republican or conservative prosecutor now from saying, well, now I'm gonna go after Joe Biden or his family or Bill Clinton? or Hillary Clinton, or Nancy Pelosi, whoever. What's gonna stop them? Nothing's gonna stop them, because today we set a new normal. Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith of Mississippi threw her support behind President Trump's 2024 presidential bid on the evening before President Trump's arraignment. Hyde-Smith said in a lengthy statement, I am endorsing Donald J. Trump for another term in the White House and will be working to assist him in winning the Republican nomination for president in 2024. Hyde became the first woman to represent Mississippi when she was sworn into Congress in 2018. She was formerly a Democrat and she switched parties in 2010. Hyde Smith called the persecution of President Trump on Twitter a political stunt by a prosecutor whose campaign was funded by George Soros. That charade is all about self-promotion by the prosecutor and has nothing to do with justice. She praised the policies of the Trump era for making America better. She said that President Trump 
cut taxes, appointed conservative judges, increased wages, and made the country energy independent in addition to cultivating a healthy economy and garnering respect from nations around the world. She added, I support a return to those policies and to President Trump's effective leadership. In addition to her, Several senators, including Senators Lindsey Graham, Tommy Tuberville, Mark Wayne Mullen, Eric Schmidt, and J.D. Vance also expressed their support for President Trump. J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon warned that storm clouds loom over the American economy under Biden, and America seems to be moving into a vicious cycle. In a wide-ranging 43-page letter to shareholders, Diamond claimed that the U.S. banking crisis is not yet over. Even after it ends, its effects will last a long time. He believes that financial authorities rushed through a rescue package to stem a run on bank deposits that were triggered by the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank SVB, which threatened broader financial instability. Diamond noted any crisis that damages Americans' trust in their banks damages all banks, a fact that was known even before this crisis. Reportedly, in the two weeks since SVB failed, worried savers rushed to withdraw roughly $213 billion in deposits from America's domestically chartered commercial banks. In comparison to the roughly $16 trillion in total deposits held in U.S. domestic banks, some argue that it's just a small amount. However, experts have warned that the deposit flight is contributing to tighter lending standards, essentially for small businesses who are particularly vulnerable to what some believe is coming soon. Diamond also believes that the banking sector's turmoil from the collapse of SVB and Credit Suisse have made a recession more likely. Though, for the time being, Diamond sees signs of strength in the U.S. economy, including solid consumer spending, recovering supply chains and healthy job markets, and higher wages. However, looking ahead, he sees trouble brewing. But why? Apart from consumer excess savings being depleted, Diamond mentioned other factors clouding the outlook for the economy. The factors include prolonged inflation, huge geopolitical strains, the unpredictable trajectory of the Russian-Ukraine war, quantitative tightening, and other unknowns that reduce liquidity and that raise long-term interest rates. Diamond blamed unprecedented government spending over the past few years for pushing inflation to multiple decade highs and forcing the Federal Reserve into a rapid interest rate hiking cycle in order to try and quash the inflation. The possibility of more deficit spending down the road estimated between $1.4 trillion and $1.8 trillion over the next three years makes controlling inflation even more difficult. Diamond noted that the Russian war in Ukraine is also affecting global energy and food prices. In other words, energy and food insecurity could lead to another level of geopolitical dislocation via mass migration. Along with higher interest rates and higher inflation, he believes that we are shifting from a savings surplus to a capital shortage. Diamond also argued that when the crisis does eventually pass, it will lead to changes in the regulatory framework while cautioning against politically motivated responses that often result in achieving the opposite of what people intended. So what should be the solution? Diamond urged U.S. financial authorities to deeply think through and coordinate complex regulations in order to achieve stated goals while getting rid of costly inefficiencies and contradictory policies instead of overregulating. NASA and the Canadian Space Agency, the CSA, will carry out the first manned mission on the path to establishing a permanent presence on the moon for science and exploration. NASA on Monday announced the four astronauts who will orbit the moon on Artemis II during an event at Ellington Field near NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. The four astronauts are NASA astronauts Reed Wiseman. Victor Glover and Christina Hammock-Kosh and CSA astronaut Jeremy Hansen. 
JSC director at NASA, Vanessa E. Weish, said for the first time in more than 50 years, these individuals, the Artemis II crew, will be the first humans to fly to the vicinity of the moon. Among the crew are the first woman, first person of color, and first Canadian on a lunar mission, and all four astronauts will represent the best of humanity as they explore for the benefit of all. The flight builds on the successful completion of the unmanned Artemis I mission in December. It paves the way for future long-term human exploration missions to the Moon and eventually to Mars. Weish added, This mission paves the way for the expansion of human deep space exploration and presents new opportunities for scientific discoveries, commercial, industry and academic partnership and the Artemis generation. With the exception of Canada's Hansen, all three astronauts have previous experience in space travel. Wiseman previously served as a flight engineer on the International Space Station's Expedition 41 from May to November in 2014. Wiseman's space record exceeds 165 days, including nearly 13 hours as chief spacewalker on two trips outside the orbital complex. Glover previously served as a pilot on NASA SpaceX Crew-1. The spacecraft landed on May 2, 2021 after 168 days in space. He participated in four spacewalks as a flight engineer aboard the Expedition 64 space station. Kosh served as a flight engineer on the space station on Expeditions 59, 60 and 61. She set the record for the longest single space flight by a woman, spending 328 days in space, and she participated in the first all-female spacewalk. Hansen, who is a colonel and former flight pilot in the Canadian Armed Forces, holds a bachelor's degree in space science and a master's degree in physics from the Royal Military College of Canada. In 2017, he became the first Canadian to be entrusted to lead a NASA astronaut class, leading the training of astronaut candidates from the United States and Canada. The astronauts of Artemis II may also fly further out in the universe than any previous human. While they won't orbit the moon or land on its surface, they could fly more than a million kilometers beyond the moon and back to the region. NASA stated that the exact distance and plan for the flight depends on a number of factors, including the date that the mission actually launches. And that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you so much for your support of Front Page. Please remember that every like, comment, and share helps more people to see the truth. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you have already subscribed, we thank you, but please double check to make sure that you are still subscribed because some of our audience have reported that they're somehow unsubscribed without their knowledge. Okay, this is our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please don't forget to like this video and then share it with your friends and family because everybody deserves to know the truth. Again, thank you for watching Front Page and we will see you next time.